So let's go ahead um, with our first session um, of this tutorial, um, which is an introduction to the community air system model and will be presented by Gokan Dana Bashoglu. Gokan is a current CSM chief scientist, a senior scientist in the oceanography section, and a past co-chair of the CSM Ocean Model Working Group. The general subjects in his research are understanding the role of the oceans in the Earth's climate system and computational modeling of the ocean as geophysical fluid. And he will be giving this session. Thank you, Gokan, for doing this. Thank you, Gunter. So I'll go ahead and start. Well, I would like to welcome everybody first uh, to the CESM tutorial. And it's a virtual one, as Gunter indicated. And it's unfortunate because uh, this tutorial is particularly very useful to early career scientists, both to learn about CESM and also uh, to uh, sort of establish connections both with each other and also with the NCAR scientists or CESM scientists in general. So unfortunate that uh, we are going, we are having this uh, in this uh, in a virtual environment. And we are hoping that everybody will essentially come to an in-person meeting, hopefully next year, uh, related to CESM, perhaps an annual workshop or a working group meeting, or maybe next year's uh, tu tutorial participation. So in any case, uh, I would like to essentially provide you some very high level introduction to the community or system model, also known as uh, CESM. So what I would like to do, as uh, Gunter indicated, everybody's background is quite different in this tutorial. So I would like to essentially provide a brief uh, introduction to global earth system models and what CESM is within that context. Then I would like to briefly uh, mention uh, a few of our efforts on coupled model intercomparison project phase six, that's CMIP six. And I'm pretty sure that you all heard about CMIP and what it's all about. And I would like to then uh, provide some updates on our ongoing activities. And the later part of the talk, the last part of the talk will be more on the uh, future looking side. Uh, what are we doing with respect to our next model version uh, towards CESM3? And I would like to mention many things here, uh, at least introduce them to you, even if you are not necessarily interested in right now, at least it'll be in your mind, it'll, you'll remember that certain things is, existed in CESM or exist in CESM so that when, when, in case you need them in the future, you can essentially come back to CESM and try to figure out what those things uh, were. So I'll try to provide brief introductions on those aspects as well. So starting with global earth system models and how CESM fits in to this uh, global earth system modeling complex. So I'll try to cover that thing briefly. As you know, global earth system models uh, represent a virtual laboratory for experimentation. We cannot do real experiments uh, with the climate and we have only one essentially sort of member of the real climate. So global earth system models uh, provide a laboratory framework or numerical laboratory framework to improve our scientific understanding of observed events or climate change. And this can be historical or paleoclimate. Uh, we can use the uh, models to simulate future climate change and its impacts. Another example is essentially, we can use them to make predictions of weather and more on the side of right now that's an uh, actually uh, emerging science area on uh, climate or perhaps more correctly, earth system uh, variability and predictability or prediction. And this, uh, the time frame for that effort covers from subseasonal to all the way to decadal, uh, decadal time scales. And these are essentially mostly referring to initialized earth system uh, predictions. So uh, global earth system models use physical equations and in terms of, uh, with respect to the ocean and the atmosphere, for example, they would be Navier-Stokes uh, Navier equations uh, from fluid dynamics. They use those equations to simulate key fields and processes in the atmosphere, ocean, land, sea ice, and land ice. These equations, of course, these are continuous equations, but they are discretized on a model grid. 
And an example is shown here. Uh, this is uh, a regular lat long grid. I'm not going to go into problems associated with such regular lat long grids, but uh, all these equations are discretized and you end up essentially solving these equations at particular uh, grid points. And they can be staggered or non-staggered. There are various uh, methods to do that. Simply because it's impossible to uh, solve these equations uh, at really small uh, spatial uh, scales, uh, it is just too costly. We end up discretizing these equations on grids usually order one degree in the horizontal. So that's uh, corresponding to order 100 kilometer uh, resolution. That's for most of the modeling centers, 100 kilometers is sort of the workhorse model uh, resolution. And clearly, there are many processes that are shown here in this uh, schematic that are essentially occurring below that grid resolution, but they are important for uh, climate so that we, we need to include their impacts in the, in, in the uh, model uh, simulations. And the way to do that, what we call them essentially parametrizations, these processes that are listed here, most of them are essentially represented in terms of resolved physics, and their, their impacts are incorporated into the model equations as uh, parametrizations. For example, we don't use uh, molecular uh, diffusivity or viscosity. Instead, uh, we, so, uh, we use uh, mesoscale, for example, in the ocean, and some mesoscale uh, essentially uh, in mixing effects through parametrizations. And they are usually uh, parametrized as uh, diffusive uh, processes in the models. So uh, CESM is one such model. Uh, it's uh, one such global earth system model. And I included a schematic here to show the components of the coupled system. We have the atmosphere, it has chemistry, and it has a high top and low top uh, version. We have the sea ice model. We have a land ice model. We have an ocean uh, model. And uh, it includes marine biogeochemistry. We have a model for uh, incorporating the impacts of uh, surface waves. River runoff model exists. And finally, we have the land model. And land model also has a biogeochemistry component. These individual uh, model components exchange both states and fluxes through a coupler. So they communicate through each other. For example, land model waves its uh, sort of wave information to the ocean model, and ocean model uses uh, that wave information, for example, to parameterize or to incorporate the impacts of Langmuir uh, mixing. And external forcing, such as greenhouse gases, anthropogenic aerosols, volcanic eruptions, and solar variability are essentially incorporated through the atmospheric model component, usually. Uh, we have uh, in the ocean model, we also, we can also account for geothermal heating, but in our regular applications, we do not use uh, that uh, uh, feature. When you're uh, essentially trying to use a coupled model, whether it's a regional version of the model or a, a global version of the model, depending upon your resources and depending upon what problem that you would like to solve, uh, you need to sort of consider uh, what I call sort of three different items uh, and to assess your resources and your capabilities. The upper part, uh, upper charts here refer to evolving model complexity. A uh, couple the uh, sort of modeling initially started as just atmosphere, ocean, two component system. And that's sort of in mid 1960s. Uh, to late 1960s. And you can see that over the years, they evolved a lot. They included many additional uh, components, uh, such as the sea ice component, ice sheet lead, uh, recently, and marine ecosystems, they're all included. So there is an increased complexity in terms of additional model components. But if you look at the, uh, the right uh, upper right panel here, not only additional component models came on board, but each component model also increased in their complexity. So hopefully you won't hear, uh, I'm at home in the basement and they're cutting our yard or uh, grass out there. So there will be some noise coming from that. Uh, the, uh, so each individual component, uh, this is actually showing as a function of time, the model complexity 
And for example, if you look at the atmosphere, there were very few features in the atmospheric model in early days. And as you can see by the thickness of these uh, sort of uh, uh, shades, they increase in their complexity as well. So this essentially increases the cost and puts more pressure on your, uh, on your uh, resources. Another uh, thing that you need to consider, depending upon what problem, what science question that you would like to answer is to consider how many ensemble members you would like to essentially perform uh, to essentially uh, entertain or to determine uh, your signal to noise ratio. How, and I'll show you one example of that thing later in the talk. Uh, you, you can start with, uh, this is sort of, I mean, in the weather scale, it's going to be the so-called butterfly effect. When you start from your initial conditions, a slight perturbation of the system can lead to uh, different uh, sort of states further in time. And uh, depending upon whether you want to essentially ass uh, assess, for example, uh, precipitation uh, likelihood in a certain region, you may need to essentially perform multiple ensemble uh, members of the same uh, model. And another constraint that, or another uh, thing that you need to consider, what resolution you would like to use in your uh, study. And this is essentially showing four different atmospheric model resolutions. Uh, T stands for triangular uh, spectral truncation. Uh, T85 is roughly 1.4 degrees. T42 is about 2.4 eight degrees, and as you go to T3340, uh, these are essentially uh, less than uh, order a few uh, tens of uh, kilometers in the atmosphere. So if you're interested in essentially higher resolution in a certain region, uh, or in the globe essentially, you need to consider uh, finer uh, resolution. Of course, it comes at the expense of uh, more computer time, and that's why this chart is given here, or this schematic here, you need to allocate your resources based on what science question that you want to answer, considering how complex you want the model to be, how many ensemble members you would like to have, and what resolution you would like to have. And some modeling uh, enterprises also, you can do uh, regional grid refinement, and in our atmospheric model with the uh, SE, uh, spectral element dynamical core, uh, regional grid refinement is also uh, possible. And you'll hear more about these uh, during this uh, week. Another, uh, so just uh, back to CESM, uh, this is uh, just to give you an idea about the organizational structure of CESM. Uh, CESM consists of 12 working groups, and our newest working group is the Earth System uh, Prediction uh, Working Group. All the ideas essentially come uh, at the working group level. If you would like to essentially have uh, engage with CESM community, and if you have ideas uh, about sort of community projects, community uh, integrations, you can attend these working group meetings. Usually there's one working group meeting for each working group during the summer workshops, and then the, the, the working groups also meet uh, during, uh, during the winter time or spring time each year. And then there's a scientific steering committee uh, about the working groups. And then we have also an advisory uh, board at the top, essentially. But the real essential ideas uh, come from, uh, uh, from below uh, at the working group level. And I just wanted to also mention that the CESM project has been in existence uh, roughly for uh, 25 uh, years. So it's a lot of experience uh, altogether. So CESM uh, code base can support uh, a range of climate science goals through a single uh, model code base. It can be used in single column applications or course resolution applications. And for example, if you use it as a single column application, for example, in the ocean model or in the atmosphere, it can be used for, for example, vertical mixing parameterizations, and they can run on uh, really laptops. We have uh, coarser resolution versions of the model and they can be used for long simulations or several uh, thousand year simulations. And they can be primarily used for, for example, paleoclimate applications. And the same code base can be used in higher resolution simulations. So as I said, in our CMIP uh, applications, we tend to use order one degree uh, horizontal grid, but we have model versions and I'm going to show you an example later on uh, that can be used also like a tenth of a degree ocean model resolution coupled to a quarter degree atmospheric model 
resolution. The code base itself uh, can support many, many possible uh, simulations. Uh, all components in our default configuration can be act are active, so all components can be active. But all component models also can be replaced with data, so-called data models. Uh, an example of this thing, for example, uh, is an ocean only or ocean sea ice coupled simulations forced with atmospheric reanalysis products. In that case, the atmospheric model is simply a data model, reads in the data sets that are needed to force an ocean model or ocean sea ice coupled model. So that configuration is available. We have other simple model, simpler model configurations. Uh, for example, aqua planet. Uh, we have several dynamical cores in the atmospheric model, and I'll show you examples of that. And you can run a slab ocean model for some applications. And there are many and uh, numerous options are available within each component. And we are also uh, sporting an increasing number of component sets and configurations as out of the box uh, available uh, configurations. And I'll talk about a little bit more about uh, more recent efforts on simple uh, models within the CESM framework. So uh, couple model into comparison uh, efforts, uh, that's CMIP6. So just to make sure that everybody is aware of this effort, uh, as you know, uh, uh, including CESM, many modeling groups, over I think right now 40 modeling groups are participating in this effort, CMIP6 effort. What it is, uh, what it is actually quite time consuming, both uh, it requires both computational resources and people re resources uh, also. It essentially involves at the core so-called DEX simulation that stands for Diagnostic Evaluation Characterization of Clima. It requires essentially each modeling group, participating modeling group, it's like an entry card. You need to run order 500 years, at least a pre-industrial control simulation, 1% CO2 increased experiment, quadrupling, instantaneous coupling, quadrupling of the carbon dioxide concentration, and AMIP, these are atmosphere only simulations. In addition to that, CMIP is essentially is designed to address certain scientific questions and it has certain themes. And these themes are given here, systematic bi model biases, and you can try to address those. There are certain uh, studies looking into variability, predictability, predictions and future scenarios. And you can also uh, look at response to, for example, external forcing. And around those themes, there are so-called endorsed model intercomparison projects. And there are many of them. And CESM actually participated, some of you may be familiar with uh, these uh, model intercomparison projects. CESM participated in about uh, 20 plus intercomparison projects. And we provided essentially two sets of uh, uh, model simulations uh, for CMIP6. The first uh, more extensive set uses our nominal one degree horizontal model resolution. And we, are, we participated both with low top with limited chemistry, that's the CAN6 model version, community atmosphere model version six. And then we also participated with higher top uh, with more extensive chemistry model version for the atmospheric component, that's the vacuum, all atmosphere community climate model. For, as I said, for cheaper applications, for maybe paleo studies that can be used for paleo applications, we also participated or, and created and participated a two degree atmospheric model version. Uh, all the other components are using the same, there's uh, like the ocean and the sea ice models are still using one degree atmospheric model, sorry, one degree horizontal resolution, but the atmospheric model is uh, at two degree uh, resolution here. And these are all available to the community. And uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about these solutions, uh, we have uh, actually an AGU CESM special virtual special issue. Uh, we are expecting total 70 manuscripts uh, for this purpose. 40 of them uh, are already published or submitted. And you can essentially go to this website and then uh, find all of these uh, uh, all of these uh, manuscripts. The ones that are published, they have a DOI number 
the ones that are still in review, they are also available and you can get their PDF uh, copies here. And the primary overview manuscript is the Community Earth System Model version two. I was the lead author for that and that has been available from the uh, website as well. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, in case uh, you hear about this and you probably heard about this thing, uh, most of the new, well, I shouldn't say most, quite a few of the newer model versions, not just CESM, but other um, models, couple models from other, other modeling groups as well, uh, they are essentially producing a larger equilibrium climate sensitivity than their previous versions. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, what equilibrium climate sensitivity is, it simply represents equilibrium change in surface temperature uh, when uh, CO2 is doubled. So you take the pre-industrial control simulation, it has a certain level of CO2, you double it, you run it to equilibrium, and then when you, uh, at equilibrium, you look at your surface temperature, you difference it from the beginning state or the pre-industrial level, and that gives you the equilibrium climate sensitivity. In practice, of course, it's not possible to run it for thousands of years, these models. They take too, mu too, much, uh, too many resources. So you try to come up with an estimate. And I just, uh, this is a chart from a paper by Jerry Neal et al. It shows equilibrium climate sensitivity as a function of transient climate response. Transient climate response is a lot easier to obtain and perhaps it's more relevant for society. It simply represents, you, you run 1% CO2 increase experiments and you look, at your, uh, you look at your surface temperature at the time of CO2 doubling and difference uh, from the original state. And that is the transient climate response. The bottom line here is that in all the older versions of the models, equilibrium climate sensitivity was not really larger than four and a half degrees. And in the new model versions, they are now in excess of four and a half in fact, over five degrees in quite a few of the models and sort of I circled the CSM solutions here. And they are, there's no single uh, so, sort of silver bullet why that this increase happened. What we found is essentially in our studies, small changes to cloud microphysics and boundary layer parameters can essentially lead to uh, these increase in equilibrium climate sensitivity. And what happens over the Southern Ocean latitudes appear to be quite important uh, regarding cloud uh, feedbacks. So I'm sure that you either heard about this thing or you'll hear more about it. Another uh, plot that I wanted to show you is a model performance summary. This is coming from our climate model analysis toolkit developed by Jan Fusula, and this is available. And what it shows here is that in the horizontal axis here, it shows a bunch of models participating in CMIP6. And in the vertical axis here, it shows about 20 or so atmospheric uh, or surface fields, and they are essentially compared to available observations or reanalysis products in terms of their mean, in terms of their uh, annual cycle or seasonal uh, variability rather, and sort of intraannual time scales as well in, are included. And energy, water, and dynamical variables are included here, and they are color-coded. For example, orange variables represent energy related fields, long way net, short way net at the surface. So in this, and there's some kind of, based on this comparison, how good the comparison is, there's a score uh, assigned to it. You want to be on the red side here. Blue numbers or green numbers, especially blue numbers are not so good. So I just wanted to essentially highlight that in the top 10 roughly, I, I believe, uh, of the, our four CSM contributions are highly rated. Uh, meaning that uh, the CSM model simulations are among the top couple model simulations in representing observations based on observational based analysis uh, or results or uh, reanalysis products. So it's quite good for CSM. And this is available also in a paper uh, by John Fosulo. Okay, so what's going on? And I, I just want to provide some brief updates now. Uh, we have uh, essentially the main CSM 2.0 uh, 2 version of the model was released in uh, summer of 2018. And since then, we have uh, had three what we call incremental releases. These are not answer changing releases. They're essentially adding more 
out-of-the-box configurations available to the community. And we're anticipating that there's going to be another release in September next month. And this is going to be an answer changing release. It's going to include some additional uh, features uh, on top of what we had released uh, earlier. Uh, and there are some changes in the land model or new functionalities, for example. And then the ocean model is going to also include a version of its new ocean component, modular ocean model uh, version six, that's month six. And I'll mention a slide, a sure slide on that in, uh, at the end. Another, uh, as I indicated, uh, we have newly formed a new working group, Earth System Prediction Working Group. And the idea here is essentially this working group will serve the CESM and broader geoscience community by facilitating and coordinating fundamental research focused on understanding and advancing research on initialized Earth System predictions on time scales from subseasonal uh, to multi decadal. And uh, we will perform uh, large ensembles of initialized predictions that cannot be afforded by the individual uh, PI. And they, just like our uh, CSM1 large ensemble or CSM1 decadal prediction large ensemble, they'll be available to the community. And we have been actually uh, doing quite well in terms of our predictions. This is showing essentially two meter air temperature skill. Uh, skill is shown here, so larger number is good and from several modeling groups. CSM results are shown in blue here, and we are doing much better than some of the other uh, uh, center uh, skill, uh, skill reported by some of the other uh, centers uh, prediction systems. On the decadal time scales, uh, we have a 40 member large ensemble, and this is essentially being used a lot by the broader community, both at the national level and international level. And I wanted to show you just one quick example here. Uh, this is showing skill in summer precipitation over the Sahel region here, in this box region, uh, over three to seven year, let's say roughly five year lead times. The top panel here is the anomaly correlation uh, coefficient. It's shown as a function of ensemble size. The blue line here is uninitialized predictions or uninitialized simulations, they are not predictions, and it's just, just uninitialized runs. We don't expect any skill necessarily. And the decadal prediction large ensemble, the red line here is from our initialized system. So for this metric, it's easy to beat the uninitialized system. So there is no issue there. But another important metric for prediction simulations is so-called persistence. Is the next year going to be the same as this year? And you can see the persistent line here at the dash line, shown as the dash line here. In order to be able to predict, uh, beat Persistence, you need over 30 ensemble members. In order to be able to beat persistence at the 95% confidence level, you need 30 ensemble members. So this is essentially showing an example of why you need multiple ensemble members. And of course, this depends upon geographical region and the field that you are uh, looking for. And this is showing a comparison of our decadal prediction system. Blue is uninitialized. Red, uh, black is the OBS in this case, and then the red is our decadal prediction system. So it's doing quite well in terms of essentially predicting uh, uh, sort of low frequency signals in precipitation in this region. Okay, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that you may need multiple ensemble members, and this is just to show you an example of that. As I mentioned earlier, we have CSM1 large ensemble simulations available for communities use. And I wanted to show you what I meant by that. So what is shown here is the sea surface temperature variability with a focus in the North Atlantic. It's usually referred to as Atlantic multi-decadal variability, but you don't need to know that. The top four lines here, or four panels here from left towards right, are observational or reanalysis-based estimates of sea surface temperature anomaly, its low frequency component. And what is shown in the remaining 20 panels is just by changing uh, the atmospheric temperature field in the 16th digit in, in its initial conditions, you can get different representation of this variability as shown here. So if you're interested in what's happening, for example, in the South Atlantic, this is showing, for example, cold anomalies. This is showing warm anomalies. 
So you need to be able to run multiple ensemble members to get some confidence on which one is essentially more likely. So that's why you may need to use it, uh, multiple ensemble members. But I wanted to highlight that this kind of product is available for everybody to use uh, in C uh, for the community. Indeed, you're essentially performing uh, a new large ensemble, CSM2 large ensemble. It's in collaboration with our colleagues in uh, South Korea. The previous large ensemble was performed only with 40 ensemble members. This new one is going to be, is being performed rather uh, uh, for uh, you, you will be producing 100 ensemble members. Uh, this is slightly older slide actually right now about half of it, uh, half of the ensemble members uh, have been completed. Uh, we are anticipating that the full data set will be completed by December 2020. And after uh, seamorizing, making sure that the outputs are standard and all that, uh, all of the data sets uh, from CSM2 large ensemble will also be available to the community uh, likely in early uh, 2021. I'm sure that you'll be using this data set a lot. And uh, just to coming back also, uh, we have also data assimilation capabilities within the CSM framework. And we use data assimilation research testbed for that purpose. Uh, at our current uh, sort of uh, research level, uh, we have a prototype of what we call strongly coupled data assimilation system meaning that the uh, atmosphere and ocean model use a single uh, covariance matrix rather than two independent ones. So a prototype of this uh, uh, data assimilation system within the fully coupled framework is running. Uh, but I wanted to make sure you understand the difference here. Uh, there are various ways of performing data assimilation. This is using ensemble common filter, meaning that each component model requires multiple uh, members, up to maybe 40 or even more uh, members uh, running simultaneously to get the ensemble spread correct or reasonable. And that you can imagine, if you are using 40 ensemble members, that means it's going to cost you 40 times more than a regular uh, coupled system to run this. So it is not really economical. So in order to be able to essentially provide a more affordable uh, data assimilation system, we have recently developed a new approach. The approach itself is not new, but the implemented, its implementation in, is, in DART is new, so-called ensemble optimal interpolation uh, technique. I don't want to go into uh, many details here, but in uh, contrast to the ensemble common filter approach, which required multiple running multiple ensemble members, this technique is essentially requires running only one ensemble member, but the spread is essentially based on some previous knowledge of possible spread that comes from an existing uh, simulation. And this is rather affordable, even at high resolution uh, frameworks. And another thing that I wanted to mention, we do also have a high resolution version of the model and the results from this uh, are already available. And uh, this is actually a collaboration uh, uh, under the IHAS umbrella, International Laboratory for High Resolution Earth System Predictions. It is between us, Texas A&M University, and also the Chinda National Laboratory for Marine Science and Technology. We are using a slightly older version of the model for this purpose, CSM 1.3. The code base has been substantially rewritten to run on uh, the machines in China, they are Sunway systems. They are somewhere in between CPU and GPU based systems. And that code base is available. And then the manuscript has been recently accepted, I believe. Uh, I think it's accepted in uh, GMD, Ge the Geoscientific Model uh, Development. And if you are interested in using these data sets, uh, what we have is a 500 year pre industrial control simulation. We have a 1850-2100 transient simulation run with RCP 8.5 scenario. We have an 80-year 1% CO2 increase run. And we have also four cycles of ocean sea ice coupled forced pine cast simulations for the 1958-2018 period. As of July, uh, June 8, uh, we, uh, we made some of these simulations already available. I should also mention that we have also uh, completed uh, contributions for high res 130 year 18, 1950 control 
1950-2050 transient simulation and 1950-2050 just uh, atmosphere only simulation and it's uh, corresponding low resolution simulations are also available so some of the simulations were made available uh, solutions available uh, on june 8th the rest of the uh, uh, data sets will be available uh, by the end of this year and there's a manuscript already just submitted actually you can find that manuscript from the ihas website if you type ihas on google you'll get that get to that web page okay towards csm3 so this is the last part of the talk and i just wanted to uh, give you an idea about where we are going in our model uh, so we are essentially developing uh, idealized modeling toolkits. This is going to make it a lot easier uh, to essentially know what idealized model configurations available within CESM. We'll be also developing some new idealized model configurations such as extension, extensions of the single column ocean model. Uh, what I call pencil model that will be uh, hopefully including the Ekman component as well. But uh, it is going to be essentially a nice uh, framework to figure out what's going on with CSM uh, simple modeling uh, efforts. We are uh, recently essentially looking into increasing our atmospheric standard atmospheric model resolution uh, higher than what it is uh, already. And also not only increasing the vertical resolution, but also we would like to increase the model top. And this will uh, essentially, uh, it will not be as high as what our high top model does, but it will be extending higher than the present low top version uh, to improve vertical resolution in the free troposphere and stratosphere. And the idea is uh, particularly to get a better uh, representation of the uh, QBO, that's the quasi biannual uh, oscillation. And it's shown here from ERA uh, reanalysis product. And you can see as a function of vertical resolution how uh, this uh, oscillation is represented in the model. So we are right now shooting for around uh, 500 to 600 meters resolution uh, within the free uh, troposphere. Another thing that uh, we are actually looking into is uh changing our atmospheric dynamical core from the present regular lat long finite volume dynamical core and we are considering three options one is the SE die core uh, that stands for spectral element uh, dynamical core it's a highly scalable hydrostatic dynamical core and you can essentially do grid refinement with that and it can run also physics on a separate uh, usually coarser grid for uniform grid applications uh, as well. We also so-called finite volume three, FE3 dynamical core. And it's again, uh, in, uh, the uh, cube sphere version of the regular lat long uh, finite volume dynamical core. And the third dynamical core is MPAS. Uh, that is an irregular grid dynamical core. And it's shown here in a sort of hexagonal uh, grid configuration here in the lower panel. So we'll be having some sort of a backup in these dynamical cores, uh, either later this year or likely early next year. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, we are also changing our ocean model from POP2, which is used in CESM2, it'll be MOM6 in CESM3. Uh, we have a development prototype MOM6 version running within CESM framework in both fully coupled and ocean sea ice coupled configurations. Currently, uh, we are using a two thirds degree horizontal grid. It's a tripole grid with equatorial refinement with 65 vertical levels. And as we speak, we are conducting extensive experience, uh, extensive simulations to gain uh, more experience with this code base because it's using a different uh, vertical grid structure or vertical uh, uh, discretization approach. Uh, so it is, uh, we are trying to learn how this model behaves, essentially. Uh, lots of documentation and training opportunities are possible. We are conducting webinars uh, to sort of make sure that people know about this thing. And there are certain uh, practical cases, use cases available on the website as well. And if you have more questions about this thing, uh, Gustavo is one of the organizers of this uh, tutorial. Uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any MOM6 related uh, questions. And just for your information also, 
Then I said, we are going to release CSM 2.2 uh, in September, like the September timeframe, there's going to be an early friendly user uh, version of MOM6, functional release version of MOM6 available in that model release as well. And this is just to show you that uh, model is working and then we are getting reasonable solutions, for example, uh, in representation of Atlantic meridional overturning circulation at 26 degrees north compared to other uh, model versions, just showing the time series here. Okay, with that, uh, 40 minutes exactly, and I would like to stop, and I just wanted to show you the similar picture as uh, what Gunter showed. If it weren't for the uh, virus, we would be uh, actually uh, in this building uh, up here uh, conducting this tutorial in the main seminar room. In any case, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gokhan, uh, for this great presentation. And so, yeah, let's open the floor to questions. And please don't be shy. Raise your hands, and we'll give you the floor. And you know, for you to to take the time to think of a question, I will ask the first question, uh, simple question, hopefully. Um, are the previous version of CSM now becoming obsolete? Well, not quite, uh, because we are still sporting. In fact, we changed our recent data policy to sport some of the earlier code versions going all the way back to CCSM4, roughly 10 years ago. And there are several reasons for that. Is, uh, University users, like graduate students and all that stuff, work with their older versions of the model. We would like to keep that sport going so that PhD students can actually finish their thesis. And we're also made aware that some of the older versions are still used heavily by the university community. And so that's one reason. The second reason is that CSM1, for example, decadal predictions and the large ensembles are still using CSM 1.1 code base. And that's roughly 10 years old. And that, they are also being still uh, supported. And similarly, our high res simulation CSM 1.3, uh, almost eight years or nine years old. And we are still supporting that because that's the only high res version that we have right now. So they are, I guess the short answer is yes, we are supporting uh, the older version within reason, though. All right. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, Marta, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, yes, yeah, so well, that's a question I asked you, Gunter, uh, on my email, because I'm curious about how you do coupling. And one thing, uh, the question I have is that if you're using different initial conditions, for instance, on uh, ocean reanalysis and atmospheric reanalysis, how do you make sure that those initial conditions are consistent? Do you like use a protocol? Do you check that before? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have anything automated at this point. And you need to be really careful as a user how to do that. Uh, at, uh, for example, from the ocean side, if the DA product, reanalysis product, is performed using our ocean model, uh, then there is no issue because then it's done in a consistent way. However, we have also, in fact, I've done, I've done that in the past as well. If you would like to take, for example, GFDL's data assimilation system and bring it, bring the ocean initial state to our version of the model, you need to make sure that the bottom topographies, for example, match. You need to make sure that the temperature and salinity are properly filled in uh, in case there is a new sort of ocean uh, bottom top of due to ocean uh, regions due to changes in bottom topography. But more importantly, you need to obey, for example, in the ocean model, barotropic baroclinic split. You need to make sure that the vertical integral of baroclinic mode is essentially zero. And the vertically integrated of uh, integrated total velocity adds up to the barotropic uh, mode. And you have to unfortunately do those things uh, offline and make sure that everything is consistent. Uh, I mean, you can imagine that every system is different, so there is no uh, easy way to do that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, but 
Well, it, it, it answers uh, partly uh, you have the question if you are using, for instance, if you have different, um, you get the data for the atmospheric part from a reanalysis, but then the data for the ocean part from another reanalysis, and you also need to do some checks to make sure that they both match. Yes, I mean, that, that's a big issue. I mean, right now we are dealing with something similar to, uh, regardless of what you do in that case, since the two reanalysis products are not the same, and that's why we are, uh, I showed that slide on coupled data assimilation. That's one of the ways that you can avoid inconsistency between the two systems. And uh, I think whatever you do, there's going to be some kind of initialization shock of the system that you need to essentially be careful in the interpretation of early part of the results. And it'll likely end up uh, using, I mean, you'll end up likely uh, using bias correction for that purpose. Okay, Mary Beth? Hi, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, um, in the MOM 6, you were talking about how there's the three different um, uh, grids that you could use. And I was wondering what would be the benefit of using the uh, hex, uh, I think, I believe it was a hexagonal grid versus a rectangular grid. So that was actually not MOM, that was the atmospheric dynamical core uh, options, essentially. Okay. But uh, so that is MPAS uh, atmosphere, that is the MPAS, it's on irregular uh, grid. One advantage essentially of that configuration is you can do regional grid refinement uh, in any way, any, any region that you would like to have. So that's one advantage. Of, but it's not necessarily the grid structure per se, it's essentially of that system. It's an irregular grid and it allows you to do that. I guess it comes with the grid. So that's one big advantage. You can do a regional grid refinement without going into, uh, all, without, you can do it in multiple regions in a single global application. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one uh, beauty of it. But it's very expensive because it's irregular. You, you don't know where your nearest neighbor is and it, computationally becomes extremely expensive. And also, potentially, it can represent the coastal regions, for example, uh, uh, much better. Uh, you can essentially, for example, you can do grid refinement in, let's say, in Gibraltar region. You can put a lot of grid there with large, higher grid resolution, and then make it coarser. So it will essentially adjust the coastal regions uh, a lot, or adapt the coastal regions a lot better. So those are uh, sort of two or three advantages. Probably I missed a few, but it's expensive though, very expensive. Okay, any other questions? We have time for one more. King? Hi. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, please correct me if I mispronounce your name. That's correct. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go yes. ahead. Yeah, thanks for the lecture. And you know, you, you mentioned the refinement. When we need a uh, higher resolution, we can do refinement for, for a certain uh, region. And meanwhile, we can also use regional climate model. So I wonder what's the uh, difference between the two approaches and what's the pros and cons of them? Well, the biggest part uh, that I can think of right now is essentially when you do regional refinement in a global modeling context, you allow two-way two grid interaction. So in other words, what's happening in the, uh, in the, in the regional, in, in the refined area can directly communicate without any uh, sort of ad hoc uh, issues. And everything is done in a conservative way, in a sense, because it's within the same system. Uh, within, when you do it in a regional coupled model, in fact, we do have a regional uh, coupled model version of it. It's essentially supported by Texas A&M as part of our collaboration. The issue is there is essentially, it is not embedded. If it is not embedded, uh, then you have to provide some kind of boundary conditions. Then you have to deal with the sort of sponge layers and all that stuff. And you are likely at the mercy of the boundary conditions that you are specifying at that point. Even if it is embedded, your regional system is embedded in the coupled, fully coupled system, which we have a version as well that you can use, 
uh, then it becomes essentially one-way coupling technically. Some people call it two-way coupling because of the uh, SSD interaction uh, with the atmosphere in that finer grid. But that's, uh, in my view, the biggest uh, thing. However, a big disadvantage of regional refinement in a global coupled system is that you, if you do, for example, North Atlantic refinement, it, you end up essentially spending pretty much entire your computer time in that region in any case. Your CFL condition will likely be dictated by the time step or grid resolution in that region. So you are going to be paying a lot of uh, computer resources. Uh, my understanding is that if you do sort of some sort of regional refinement with MPAS, 90% of the resources are being spent in that regionally refined region. So you need to be careful with what your science question is. Thanks. There's another question from Rachel. Oh, thank you. Would you mind talking a little bit about the ICASM and uh, what version is supported on? Which one? ICASM? That's the isotope enabled version? Is that what yes. that is? Yeah, I'm going uh, <laughs> to. That is a. Uh, my, so you can essentially talk to Betty and Esther about that thing and you'll get more uh, accurate information probably from them. It is unfortunately right now that it is supported only an older version of the model. I mean, uh, I think it's supported in CESM1 or CCSM4, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we had a few meetings to bring all of the features of the isotope enabled version to a more recent model version. Uh, unfortunately, there is some work going on, but it won't be completed probably for another year or so because it is it it, it was more expensive, more extensive uh, than we originally thought. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's CCSM4 or CSM1 based at this point, and that's another reason that we need to essentially provide support for that version. But uh, please ask Betty or Esther about that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, we reached the, um, our time for this session. Thank you so much, Gokhan.